this week. Sheep grazing under an agrivoltaics solar project in Australia has been found to produce higher quality wool. Solar power is just amazing, James. Is there anything it can't do? Well, it, it can't produce power at night, I'm told. Oh, right. Yeah, I forgot. Uh, unless the planet stops spinning. Uh, the main current in the Atlantic Ocean may collapse in as soon as 15 years, but that's okay because Canadian politicians just declared CO2 good and necessary for life, and we should never be smooch it. This just in from the Clean Energy Show Decision Desk. Canadian politicians are mindless idiots with their heads in the sand. A new solar recycling plant in Georgia will be able to recycle 99% of solar panel materials. So far, here at the Clean Energy Show, we've only managed to recycle about 50% of the jokes featured at the top of the show. We'll do better, I promise. All that and more on this edition of the Clean Energy Show. And also this week, Brian, is carbon capture in the oil sands a good thing for the planet? Toyota sales are down, and I think you know why. Is working from home better for the environment? Of course it is. We'll find out just how much better. Yeah, so uh, I just got back from a quick trip. I've been traveling a lot lately and another trip to uh, the United States of America. A uh, quick trip to Ann Arbor, Michigan. May I say that you got out of there just in time? <laughs> You're like a, <laughs> yes. an action hero running away from an explosion that just tickles your butt. The fire yes. just well, tickles behind. Here's the thing. Like, as we were booking the trip, we realized how close it was to Election Day. So we made sure to get out of the country on Sunday to give us a buffer of a couple of days, uh, you know, so was, we wouldn't get caught up in Election Day uh, hijinks if, if such things occur. Riots. Um, <laughs> I don't know. People are a bit paranoid. I don't think nothing's going to happen. We know that. But yeah. uh, still, it's, it's a weird time to, to be there. I and mean, most of our listeners are from the United States. We're not, uh, you know, you know d disparaging you. But uh, from the northern border, it looks uh, scary sometimes, especially yeah. on elections. And, uh, you know, I've been avoiding most of the U.S. election coverage because, as we've discussed before, we're Canadian. We cannot vote in the American election, and yet we're completely inundated with all of this news about it. I want to say that I tried to vote in the American election. The reason why I say that is I want to be on Fox News to promote the podcast. <laughs> so, yeah, Fox News. I voted six times. <laughs> That's good. Well, I mean, you could maybe somehow demonstrate that you know, uh, voter fraud isn't that big a deal. If you tried to vote and then couldn't, um, that might be a way to go. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, we, you know, we can't vote. We're Canadian. And if we could vote, we would have decided who to vote for roughly 10 years ago. So it's, it's better for me to just stay away from it because it, it, it all, of course, drives me crazy. And I, I suppose many people, but being in Ann Arbor over the weekend, of course, we're in America. And it was basically impossible to avoid any of that, mostly by just like sitting well, in the hotel. Ann Arbor, Michigan is a swing state. It's where it's a huge. Yeah, I, I'm sure that there are no ads because we get our we get our um, cable TV from you know, our U.S. networks from D Detroit. Yeah. So if I don't watch much network TV, but I watched Saturday Night Live the other night. And of course, every commercial is uh, like literally like one attack ad. Oh, Kamala's bad. Oh, Trump's bad. Oh. And it goes back and forth, and then they're just nasty, of course, because they're effective. Yeah. No, this is exactly what I experienced. Although downtown o o Ann Arbor, I think it's a bit of an old, you know, it's got a lot of hippie roots, I think. So it was mostly, um, you know, Harris Waltz signs around. So, you know, in downtown Ar Ann Arbor. But yeah, just like sitting in restaurants, sitting in the hotel lobby, they've, there's always a TV on, so we couldn't avoid the attack ads and, you know, they were relentless, nonstop. I guess they do work, as you say, so that's why they do them. I'm surprised you but, weren't interviewed by journalists uh, if you went to a cafe to say, <laughs> you know, what are you thinking? Yeah, yeah. G What's your number one a, issue? A swing state. But no, we were sitting there in the hotel lobby and, and the TV was on and there was this one particular ad and I'll just say it was for Jim Smith or whatever. And it was it was all about how wonderful Jim Smith is. It wasn't an attack ad. It, Jim Smith is doing this and doing that and all this great work for the people of Michigan and, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, just as a joke, I turned to my partner and said, oh, this, this Jim Smith, he sounds fantastic. I, wow. I, you know, I wish we could vote for him. 
And then literally two commercials later was this massive attack ad for the same guy. Jim Smith is a horrible person who eats babies for breakfast and yes. needs to go to jail. And, <laughs> and I turned to my partner and said, oh, this Jim Smith guy is terrible. He, somebody should put him in jail. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, I, I feel sorry for, you know, because there's so much money in American politics and there's two ele election cycle every two years at least. Uh, it's got to be depressing. To, I mean, you, you're probably getting it on social media, I assume, as well. And it's just, you know, <laughs> we're getting election stuff here and our listeners are getting them in the ads in Canada, but whatever. I don't know. St I'll be glad when it's over. Everyone's going to be glad when it's over. Yeah, and I assume it just turns a lot of people off of the whole idea of politics, like just, you know, these endless attack ads. Well, you it's see everyone annoying. is evil. Every politician is garbage, you know, that's, and maybe yeah. they are. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, the attack ads are more like horror movies than anything else. They, uh, they take on that same sort of uh, technique. So it was Halloween on Thursday. My daughter, although she's 17, decided to go trick-or-treating with her friends. You know what? I wish I could have done that. <laughs> Free candy. But <laughs> sure. uh, yeah, that's high school girls are doing that more often, she says, than you would think. And, you know, she doesn't look old. I, when I was in grade six, I think I got called on by somebody to say, aren't you a bit old for this? Because <laughs> I was big. I was tall and I was wide and I just didn't look like a kid. But, you know, I still remember that. And I, I, we get a lot of kids at the door here are teenagers, too. In fact, a lot of people come to our neighborhood from other neighborhoods because they think that uh, there's good pickings here. And there is, <laughs> you know, my daughter yeah. has a, a trophy case of uh, full size and even king size chocolate bars. <laughs> so, yeah, people are trying to uh, to do that. But her friends uh, peeked in the house and I was kind of struck by what they said. They said, oh, my God, Amelia, you're rich. You have two floors and I <laughs> and two EVs. And I... You know, everything, uh, wealth, uh, well-being um, is in context to someone else, right? I spend my days feeling poor, but there's people who live in cardboard boxes in the world. And there are people who live in more modest houses, uh, you know, half a kilometer, a kilometer away where her friends live. And, you know, it just really struck me that, uh, but I, th I mentioned it because they associated EVs with wealth and they noted the two yeah. EVs. and. You know, one is barely running right now, but the other one is new. And yeah, we're happy with them. And I love driving them all the time. But. Yeah. And we know that you've gotten into EVs at the cheapest possible price point, including, you know, importing a very old Nissan Leaf from Quebec several years ago. And we both know that buying EVs is a way to save money. Eventually, yes. it's, you know, they still cost you generally more up front, although we're getting close to price parity but they are cheaper in the long run. So I have a gas uh, SUV in the driveway that we used to use for camping, pulling a camper, and it's sitting there now mostly as a backup. But we were using that as my car to drive the kids to school and do my stuff. And I calculated that the uh, EV would pay for itself. It was about $10,500 yeah. in five years. It Gas went up and it paid for itself. Then less than four and a half years. So it's a free vehicle by making that decision to do that. Yeah. Um, and of course, I have to put some money into it now. But if I do, if I was able to put a few thousand dollars into it, and I'm not, but if I did, it would probably be worth it. But, you know, and like it would, I yeah. have no indication that it's not, the battery's not going to last another 10 years. Like there's nothing, uh, you know, for my needs. It, yeah, the range has gone down, but it's still just a city car as all it was ever meant to be. And it would work fine. Yeah, and you've always been very good at running the numbers and, and making your dollar stretch uh, as far as possible. That's right. Well, Brian, I was looking for a quote from a Canadian politician for a story I was working on, and I couldn't find it anywhere. It's so frustrating when you, you know they said something and you yeah. can't find it. I even tried chat GPT and, uh, well, I actually got a hit for it. And where was it from? It was from our podcast, episode <laughs> 35 of our podcast. <laughs> And uh, I made a mistake because I got a politician wrong at first, but eventually I got it right. And then I came across our podcast. I listened to it and it would oh, yeah. be around September of our first year because we've wow. been doing this podcast for five. Boy, were we different, raw and different than you would hear us now. 
Um, Interesting. I, I was surprised because I thought we got off to a fairly quick start. Not instant, but quick. Yeah. And yeah, if you listen to that, don't go do that, people, because it's, it's no. so old. I don't, even know if you, I don't even know if you can find it that easily. But anyway, here's the quote. This is from Canadian provincial politician uh, Jason Kenney, who was running Alberta, the oil-rich province of Alberta at the time. He says, if you really think the this first of all, this is in response to California talking about banning uh, combustion vehicles around 2035 at the time. They just had announced it, and yeah. I think they've backed off on that, and they may go back again. But um, that's what they said. And so he responded, he said, if you really think, he called them, you know, Californians aren't, aren't the same as everybody. They're very pious and yeah. about their, their energy. And he said, if you really think the billion people in India who desperately want to move to a higher standard of living are all going to be driving Teslas 15 years from now, you're disconnected from reality, Kenny said. Uh, they don't have the luxury of repeating all the California-style pieties. They want to stop burning cow dung, which was insulting, of course, to the Indian people. They're not all burning cow dung to stay warm or to cook their dinner. Uh, yeah, so I thought I would check up on India as best I could and see what's going on there. And no, they're not going to drive Teslas. They're not going to all be driving Teslas. But that's the ignorance that they had at the time, thinking that EVs are Teslas. They are a semi-luxury car, a premium vehicle, and that's all there's ever going to be. And this is a problem that people and politicians have all the time. They don't know what is coming. They don't know the trajectory. They don't know the plans. Well, guess what? There is a vehicle company called Tata Motors in India. And it is selling a lot of EVs. Are they as expensive as Tesla's? No, they're cheap because that's the market. That was the initial Chinese market at first, was selling a lot of, um, yes, expensive cars, but also very cheap cars, very city cars to meet the needs of people who are just climbing uh, into the middle class. This is from the conversation. You don't have to be in India. This is just written, by the way. You don't have to be in India long to appreciate just how dramatic this electric vehicle revolution is. Whether it's electric two-wheelers or trucks, buses, or bicycles, they are hard to miss. The Indian government's financial incentives include waiving registration fees on electric vehicles, good for them, allocated distinctive green number plates under the national registration system. These vehicles stand out from the rest, so you can see what is an electric vehicle from a block away. Now, India's culminative sales of electric vehicles of all types, including cars, buses, two-wheelers, and three-wheelers, which are very common there, remember, exceeded 4.1 million in March 2024, but 1.7 million were sold in the year to March alone. That's 1.7. That was an 80% increase. And keep in mind, they are just getting going. This is the tip of the iceberg. They're just getting their feet in place. Yes, Tesla may want to set up shop there, but it's not going to be the number one seller. It's not in China, I don't think. Uh, it has sometimes, but the other EV makers have come on board. Um, India made Tata Tiago EV a five-door hashback with a starting price of around $10,000 US. It has a range up to 315 kilometers for the higher trims, a little bit less for the low starting price of $10,000, but that is what a lot of people are into getting. Now, they know that the operational costs are also lower because you don't have to buy gas. Uh, Tata, Motors sale, uh, Tata Motors dropped prices of their EVs by as much as 8% in February of this year due to lower battery prices. The car company expects 25% of its car sales to be EVs by next year. That is the year after 2025. Uh, the luxury market remains small. A Volvo C40 recharge starts around $70,000 US, uh, way beyond the budget of most people in India. What's driving these changes? India has a huge pollution problem and urgently needs to shift to clean power. Every day, Delhi locals check the deteriorating Air quality index, like you or I, Brian, check the weather report. It is essential, and they want the air cleaned. Yes, and also we have been checking the air quality, too, mostly because of forest fires, unfortunately, in the summer. And that freaking refinery down the block for me. So, yeah, which is killing me. Uh, and if you are going from burning cow dung to buying your first vehicle, guess what? You don't have any experience or expectations about gas vehicles. You can just buy your first EV and not ask where do I charge, you know, like, um, it's just a different experience because you're buying your first vehicle. And that's what many people entering the middle class are doing in India. Yeah, fantastic. 
All right, this story from Clean Technica. We love to talk about agrivoltaics here on the Clean Energy Show. And of course, these are projects that combine uh, agriculture, various kinds of agriculture, with solar panels. There are many crops and animal grazing and such that can coexist with solar panels. So it's great for farmers because they can end up getting two uses, basically, uh, out of the same parcel of land. Well, in Australia, they found out that sheep work particularly well with solar panels, unlike goats, who apparently like to chew through the wires. Goats are uh, not really? a good fit. Really? Yeah. Goats chew through the goats. wires. This is yeah, news. Goats, they'll eat anything. But sheep, they're... They work really well, and they're smaller than, say, cows or horses or something like that. So, again, that makes them work well with uh, solar panels. So, uh, this particular project in Australia is from LightSource BP, which is a branch of BP, British Petroleum. So, boo for that. But uh, yay, because they are doing this uh, agrivoltaics project. So, they've been taking a closer look and seeing if this project you know, the sheep and solar panels would affect the quality of the wool that they get from these merino sheep. And, uh, you know, they seem to be finding that it's better. Uh, it's actually better quality wool. And that could be due to there being more shade around. They say that the things that the sheep are grazing on are, are of a slightly higher quality with more protein. So that might be helping. The plants um, are growing better under the panels. Yeah. And so yeah. are the sheep. So they are quick to say that, you know, it's really just been this sort of one test. So this is not conclusive proof or anything that agrivoltaics will uh, increase the quality of wool, but it's a good sign that it doesn't make them any worse. I mean, there's always people that, um, you know, speak out against anything, you know, solar or new energy related, uh, you know, that are probably complaining that solar panels will give the sheep cancer or something like that, which is not true. But this was, uh, you know, great. Um, observations in this kind of early testing. Well, that's good to hear. I'm still surprised about the goats, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe there Keep could be sheathing away. around the uh, anti goat well, sure, sheathing. I don't know. There might be a way to do it. Yeah. They'd probably like to chew on that, too. I don't know. Yeah. Well, good story. Um, listen, we have some uh, listener mail that I want to get to. Lots this week. We're going to have to hold some over to next week, but let's dip into the mail bag says, hi, guys, it's your favorite Tasmanian here. You don't know that. <laughs> I might have six or seven favorite Tasmanians, which would be like sure. a quarter of the population, but still, it's possible. Yes, you are my favorite, favorite Tasmanian. I declare it. It's true. I uh, just wondered what you can tell us about the above uh, from your perspective of locals. This is a story about carbon capture in Alberta and a trunk line that they are making. <laughs> My employee is extolling the virtues of carbon capture using this sequestration and storage facility. The general feeling is that it is inefficient and leaky to say the least, but maybe you have a better handle on it because you're a local. Uh, would you be interested in your thoughts either way? Kind regards from Damon. And this is, uh, this is where they are um, taking the carbon out of the emissions from a oil refinery uh, near the tar sands, the, the oil sands in Alberta's northeast, or port, yeah, northeast. And I don't actually have a different perspective uh, <laughs> beyond as a local, because uh, fact is I'm quite cynical about Alber Alberta politicians as they face an energy transition away from the polluting crap that they peddle and throw some awesome Christmas parties with all the money they make. Um, greenwashing is a polite term. This is eco-terrorism in my mind. I'll tell you why. It's because the carbon they capture from refining oil is pumped into the ground 400 kilometers away. So it goes through a pipeline, or it's going to go through a pipeline for 400 kilometers. Why? Because they want us to pump it into the ground so that we can get more oil out. There's a place where they think that if they can pump the carbon into the ground, it'll stay there, but it'll also go through a chemical process and pump oil out and extend this oil field for 25 more years. Great. That's just what the world needs. Yeah, this has always been one of the things that's come up with carbon capture, particularly around here. We have a coal plant around here that does capture some carbon, but I think they do the same thing with uh, some or all of that carbon, pump it in the ground in the hopes of getting out more oil. 
So it's not something to celebrate, and it's not a virtuous cycle. Most, most climate and energy transition experts belittle carbon capture as a way for fossil fuel companies to continue burning things. And even though it adds costs to a declining industry that can't compete with modern forms of energy, such as solar and wind as it is, it adds more costs and makes it more expensive. And now I think it's hard to keep an eye on how and if the carbon is staying in the ground. I mean, there's an example here in Saskatchewan of a farmer 10 years ago or so. They had CO2 bubbling out of the ground. Experts said it's not the problem, but they lived there for generations and never had carbon bubbling out of the ground before. Because we have a, uh, you know, a sequestration site here where we capture it from a coal plant and put it into the ground. And huge subsidies are coming from the government just to keep burning something they really love burning. So this, the government is often paying for a lot of this or putting huge subsidies into it to protect jobs, which could just transition to different kinds of energy jobs. There's no need for it. They're not going to compete with Saudi Arabia. Alberta is not going to be able to compete. It's already things are crumbling around them as we speak. And, and who knows, this is, this is the start of the end because prices are down. There's another story on cbc.ca today, today talking about how prices are looking to be down for some time because it's getting easier to produce oil. And it's not easy to produce oil in Alberta, especially for the tar sands. Uh, prices will one day collapse and it'll even be more wasteful to put money into this approach, I think. The same money could be going to renewables and creating jobs. Why not? Most experts think that this is a limited role for carbon capture. Things like cement, perhaps. The manufacturing of cement, we have to decarbonize that. However, yeah. they're coming up with other solutions, too, for that, that may not even need carbon capture. Yeah, embodying the carbon into cement is a thing that, uh, a process that people have come up with. So that's certainly better than pumping it into the ground to try and get more oil out. So our listener who wrote in, his company is doing just that with nitrogen production in Alberta, which is maybe why he heard about it. Uh, however, that carbon they are capturing is used to extract more oil. So you're, you're making nitrogen, but you're taking the emissions from the nitrogen and putting it into oil production, which doesn't exactly make the nitrogen green if you're making, if it allows you to burn more oil. Um, so there's no way that I'm happy with that. This is from the Narwhal.ca, that is a left-wing newspaper in Canada. Officials have decided a provincial environmental assessment will not be required of the $16 billion carbon capture plan, despite a request from the Athabasca uh, First Nation landowners and environmental groups. The project aims to bury 10 to 12 megatons of carbon dioxide deep underground each year sounds like a lot, doesn't it, Brian? But it's not. In fact, it's roughly equivalent to the carbon pollution emitted by the oil sands alone every six weeks. So no environmental review for this. But if you want to throw up a, a solar panel and wind turbine look out, there's oppressive regulations to keep you from even looking at that form of energy in Alberta. You can't even look at a wind turbine because it might ruin their view. So they're not going to let you put one up and the renewable industry is greatly diminished there because of new regulations. And with a cost of $16 billion for this, just imagine how many solar panels, wind turbines, and batteries are two you NFL with stadiums. That? Two NFL I stadiums. mean, you could, you could power a very good portion of the province. Of course you could. Uh, of course you could. But no, that wouldn't burn oil, so we got to do something else. It, does, it makes no sense to me. It's just... It, it's it's it, the, the, the way they talk has become more desperate, you know, when they start doing things that we'll talk about later, and it's ridiculous. But yeah, there is some desperation, I think, now in oil country. Uh, okay, some more feedback here. This is from our Patreon page, and we encourage you all uh, to go there and sign up. This is from our friend Mike on Patreon, uh, and he says, if you want to learn more about small-scale biochar operations, check out former Reginan and longtime Salt Spring Islander Brian Smallshaw's work. Keep up the great shows. And that was the best rant I've ever heard against climate collapse complacency. Every NDP MLA and every NDP supporter should listen to it. Thanks. That's reference to uh, your rant last week, James, about... Uh, you know, climate and Canadian politics uh, around here. And uh, I'm just glad you didn't have a heart attack. <laughs> Me too. I was wondering if I was going to make it through today's show. I just, um, you know, James collapses on election day. 
during podcast. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. If you want to contact us, we love to hear from you. Cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. You can leave a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow. And join our online community on Patreon for free and uh, get access to additional content and uh, pay a bit of money and you'll get a bit more. And I'm pleased to announce that we do have a SpeakPipe um, voicemail from this week that we'll get to a bit later in the show. This is a reminder to join our Patreon program today as a paying member and get exciting perks like ad-free high-quality episodes and our exclusive bonus episodes all early. Uh, access to the Discord server of ours, discounts at our, merchant store, our merchandise store, uh, exclusive days early access to their content, and behind-the-scenes material and private updates, and all in one centralized place, which I'm loving. That is patreon.com. Find the Clean Energy Show there. Our link is in your show notes. You also get thank you credits on our podcast and shout-outs on our audio podcast. Uh, this week, we're thanking our Patreon member, Green Bastard, Thank you for supporting the climate-positive content we produce with a membership in our Clean Club Plus executive. Uh, you can also uh, support the podcast with a purchase at our Clean Energy Store. All kinds of new merch there. Still waiting for feedback on that. Uh, yeah, we'll get some uh, contribution of your purchase, a small portion. And if uh, we have any more listener feedback, yeah, we'll have some later show. And I'll carry some over to next week because we're just going to have to do that this week. All right, so we've got a couple of quick automotive updates here. We've been talking a lot about Toyota since the very beginning of this podcast because they are... A disappointment. Tied. Yeah. I was thinking and, the other day when I was reading the Chevy forum about bolts having little bits of problems, and I was thinking, well, my Toyota wouldn't have that. Why can't I buy a Toyota? I really want to buy a Toyota <laughs> EV, and I want it to be efficient and good, and they're not right now, and I don't know how long it's going to take them. It's going to take them a while, I think. Yeah, well, I, I want to talk about that because there is huge brand loyalty for Toyota. People just love Toyota. Me too. I was at the dentist the other day, and I don't know how it came up in conversation, but my dentist um, is looking to buy a new Toyota minivan. Her existing minivan was like 10 years old or something, 12 years old or something. Then why do you need a minivan? Because your kids are probably old. Get a yeah, maybe. small SUV yeah. at the worst. But they've been waiting now almost two years to get one. They love Toyota so much, mm -hmm. they're willing to wait two years to get a minivan. There's still uh, supply chain issues or something, but uh, I thought that was crazy. Yeah, well, the Sienna looks ridiculous, okay? It's the most ridiculous looking Toyota. And the, the Prius looked better than it last generation. So <laughs> it, I just saw one, I was behind one the other day, and I thought, my God, there's not very many of them, but they look so they're startling how weird they are and, and stupid. They're yeah. very, I don't usually care about how things look in the yeah. automotive world as long as they're clean, but that one is just hideous and it's, a, it's an insult to my eyes. And yet people still love yeah. Toyota. I, I love the new refresh design of the Prius. That looks fantastic. The previous generation looked terrible. I didn't care for that. But in thinking about this and thinking about my dentist and waiting two years, like people just love Toyota so much that it sort of made me realize, oh, they're lagging on EVs is having a way bigger impact than I might have thought of. Like they're still the leaders. They're still basically tied with Volkswagen for the biggest automaker in the world. And, you know, they could have a huge amount of influence if they just, even if they just said, we love EVs and we want to go EV, but they're they continuing can't. to lag. They can't, though, because no one would buy a vehicle for a while. They'd wait for the EVs, but they're not yeah. doing that so much. But, you know, they're continuing to push hybrids, and because Toyota is pushing hybrids, and people love Toyota so much, people start to think, oh, yeah, yeah, hybrids is probably the answer, because they really trust Toyota. They're just one of these super trusted brands, and they're basically abusing that trust by lagging on EVs and, and uh, polluting the planet. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing, but, you know, We've been going on now almost five years about how much of a laggard Toyota is and really expecting them at some point to feel a hit from this in their sales so far has not happened uh, until just now. So in the first half of this year, their uh, production is down 7% from uh, this same, you know, the first half of the year last year. So they're probably definitely getting hurt in China 
which is going heavily in EVs, or just think about California is now 22% of new car sales in California are EVs. And guess what? Not a lot of those are Toyotas, maybe a couple of dozen, like they're selling very, very few EVs in California. And so it's uh, perhaps finally starting to hit them on the bottom well, line. The uh, Toyota used to be huge in, I mean, the Prius was like one of the number one selling vehicles there was there, even approaching Camry numbers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, California was absolutely, uh, Toyota was king in California. And, and with 22% EV sales there, guess what? They're not king anymore. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That's uh, amazing to see that that's happening. So anyway, the other quick uh, automotive update here. Ford has announced that they're going to shut down production of the F-150 Lightning for two months. Basically, because there just isn't enough demand. They're going to try and save a bit of money. Ford has now been surpassed by GM. GM is now selling more EVs than Ford. Ford used to be in the number two position in the U.S. So this is kind of a big deal. Um, of course, the truck is very, very expensive. Um, I think it starts at around seventy-five thousand U.S. dollars, so that's probably the main reason. I think that uh, you know the early adopters have bought one and already. Range, towing range. I mean, the Silverado. We'll see how it does. It uh, once it reaches better numbers, the uh, GM Silverado, because it has a much longer range. But the battery is so huge too. So yeah. you better be using it for towing. But I was really thinking about how much the culture of trucks is not an EV culture. It's not a technology culture. It's, um, you know, uh, it's where a lot of people are really embrace large trucks and really, you know, we talk about this all the time. People around here buy gigantic trucks just to go buy groceries. And, and they're to not pass me on the way home. Yeah. For some reason. Um, they're not necessarily into technology to the point where they probably love the old technology. You know, it's sort of like uh, I've started to take uh, photographs on film again, you know, like we've had digital cameras now for many years and it's like, well, I'm kind of tired of that. And I'm going back to shooting on film, which is super fun. It's probably not the most environmentally friendly thing to do. Like film was always kind of materials intensive and chemistry intensive, um, but it's a nice little hobby for me. But, you know, there's people that feel the same way about trucks. They love gigantic engines and they don't seem to mind you know paying two hundred dollars to fill up their trucks it's kind of crazy i know There's, but uh, someone in i think it's beyond that though i think it's uh there are people who love trucks i know some of them you know they're, they're some of them are like teenagers some of them are old but a lot of it has to do with masculinity you know in yeah. north america you're not a man if you don't drive a truck because i know i got people who tell me that I'm not a man because I don't drive a truck. They almost say it verbatim. Like, it's just crazy. Oh, you're driving that little thing. That's, that's nice. Yeah. And it's I don't somehow need a truck. the fact, like fossil fuels are also connected in people's minds with that same thing that, um, you know, EVs are somehow less uh, manly. And anyway, especially to do with trucks. So that's maybe one reason why the, the F-150 truck is not selling that well. I have somebody in my extended family who recently bought a brand new V8 truck. I'm not sure which model, but one of the largest pickup trucks you can possibly buy. And it's still made with a V8 engine. And part of the reason they bought it was it's still made with a V8 engine. And those are, you know, I was surprised there was even one available. Um, you know, I thought V8s were coming to an end, but, you know, for a certain segment of the population, it's like, oh, I better get one of these V8s before you can't get one anymore. Um, and again, don't seem to mind paying $200. Well, to, to there, I think there's paranoia out there that's maybe misinformation that V8s are going to go away. And maybe there's some truth to that because they obviously yeah. have to meet their emissions, to, you know, guidelines uh, wherever they are. So even in North America, we have guidelines for now. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, then I happen to come across this clip online on YouTube. There's a YouTuber named Julie Nolke who's a, a Canadian comedian who's very, very funny on YouTube. And um, she plays all the parts in this. So if the voices sound the same, I've got a clip to play here. Uh, it's because she's playing all the parts, which she, she normally does. Uh, but it's, uh, I thought it was very funny and relates to this discussion. It's from uh, uh, Average Men Buying Trucks, uh, available on YouTube if you want to go 
look for it and we've got to Checking out our selection of trucks, I see. Yeah, yeah, I'm interested, but uh, you know, I got a really specific set of needs. Of course. Yes. Uh, what do you do for work? Construction, plumbing, independent contracting? What? Uh, like, like, what will you be hauling? Probably my laptop most days. Okay. I got a desk job. Right. Okay. But I could haul. Like, if people, if somebody asks, like, I could. I could haul. Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, and in terms of size. Big. Big. Um, okay. And black. Well, we can choose the color later. Big and black. Great. Great. And and did you have a look at our Fords? Are you more interested in the Chevy? I'm thinking bigger. Bigger. Bigger than an than an F-150 for your daily commute to work with your laptop? Yep. Okay. Okay. And it'll also need a hitch. Right. Okay. Because you will be towing a camper or something. Actually, we've got models with really good towing capacity. No, for a set of big steel balls. Hmm. If you follow me over here, I've got a great selection of hybrid models. Whoa, whoa, are... whoa. No, I don't. I didn't hear that. I don't want any of that hybrid pansy stuff. My truck's going to run on all male gasoline. I've never heard it called that before. Yeah, for our all gas models, um, generally they're very efficient. Honestly, I kind of want it to be less efficient. I'd like to fill up daily. Oh, okay. My truck's going to be burning <laughs> through that dinosaur blood, boy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> some serious satire there. Really hits uh, close to home. How often do we find comedy related to what we cover here on the show? It's kind of a good find, Brian. <laughs> yeah. Okie dokie. Well, you know what? There's been, we, we sort of touched on this last week. There's been some science lately that isn't peer reviewed yet, but um, the people who came out with it have been accurate before. And they are saying that the, um, the basically the main current in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is something that we've always worried about coming to just a stop because of climate change. Well, they're saying there's nothing that rules it out from happening 15 years from now. Not 1,500 years, not 150 years, 15. And even I might live that long, Brian. And it has tremendous implications because that current goes all the way to the south and all the way to the north. It brushes against America, goes over to Ireland and comes back down in a loop. And it, it's, it's like a, the cardiovascular system of the planet. It keeps everything the way that it is, the way that it's, you know, takes the cold to the warm and the warm to the cold. And when that stops, that could be a problem. So I'm going to talk about that. And last week I got political and we're going to have a clip here from uh, Ariana, one day's drive away in Calgary, Alberta. Hello there, Brian and James. My name is Ariana. I live in Calgary. I've been listening to your podcast for oh, less than a year now. I'm not sure how I got involved, but so happy that I came across. I just wanted to send a voice note um, saying thank you for your most recent episode titled, Hey Politicians. Uh, I'm halfway through it right now. Just got through uh, the very interesting a break in the middle, and uh, I immediately started sharing it with people who are in that space and who help people get into that space. So um, I thank you for everything that I have learned from you um, and that I will continue to learn, and I will uh, try to be braver um, and stronger in order to push this matter forward for my children and all the other children. Um, who won't have a world to live in without us. So thank you so much. And I hope we can continue to share your story, your knowledge um, to make a change. Thank you, Ariana. You scared me for a second there because I have a niece named Ariana in Calgary. And she doesn't <laughs> sound that different than you. She doesn't have kids though. So I know it's not her, but, uh, and she's, her family is heavily invested in fossil fuels for their life and career. However, um, yeah, thank you for that. We always appreciate any feedback, let alone voicemail, which is our favorite of our favorites, Brian. And yeah, because it's an audio show. It's an audio show, and we can, it's lovely to hear the voices of our listeners. But I will move on from that and say that, uh, yeah, we, we talked about Just Have a Thank the YouTube channel last week, and they were talking about this current going down, so I did some more research on it and some reading. And the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, AMOC, we'll call it AMOC, is a major ocean current system that moves warm, salty water from the tropics. See, it's saltier in the tropics because it's hot and the water evaporates and it leaves the salt behind, so there's more salt in the water. So it carries that more salty water up north 
to all the way to the Nordic area, and it is uh, it sort of uh, gets diluted there and drops the salt off. And the AMOC is driven by differences in water temperature and salinity, which is the salt, of course, uh, which affect water density. So when it's salty, the water is more dense and it falls to the bottom. Warm surface water flows northwards, cools, and becomes saltier through evaporation. As it cools and becomes denser, the water sinks near Greenland and Labrador, forming deep currents that flow southward, creating a global conveyor belt of water movement. The AMOC influences weather patterns by distributing heat, particularly warming Western Europe, because those, the, the, uh, the current that goes there is taking warm water from the tropics. However, melting ice in the Arctic dilutes seawater. So the water that is in a, a glacier is actually, or an iceberg, or however you want to look at it, is uh, fresh water from precipitation, right? So that is not salty. So it's basically adding fresh water to the salt water, and it reduces its salinity and density, which weakens the AMOC because of the, you know, the dense water is not going to the bottom. It's going to get... Um, confused with other currents and, and stops, or it's, we th they think there's a slowdown in the AMOC, and it could disrupt weather systems leading to colder winters and severe storms in Europe. And the reason is because there's this area over the northern Atlantic that would become very cold, like 20 to 40 degrees colder. So that would go down over Europe in the winter and make it extremely cold in the winter. But in the summer, it would move north and there would be still the heat from global warming. And then there would be the conflict between those two zones of really hot and really cold. And it would cause very extreme storms. And this also could, um, you know, a slowdown could lead to uh, shifts in tropical rain belts. So where the tropics have rain belts now and monsoons could shift to the south. And there's no rainforest there to absorb it, so you have flooding. And this could happen very quickly. This is one of the things why we address climate change, because we know that there are tipping points, and this could be a sudden tipping point. Now, recently in Alberta, the same province that uh, Ariana is um, leaving the message from, where she lives, and is the oil capital of Canada, the Conservative government there, the United Conservative Party, says that they've passed a resolution, resolution at their recent meeting that's declare CO2 fundamental to human life. You know, why, why would we be smooshing it? It's fundamental to human life. Technically Can't live without true. Carbon. Technically, technically true. Technically true. However, too much of it, bad thing. Very bad thing, which could kill a lot of life, including humans. And there's going to be a lot of uh, migration and... Things that are, you know, literally a billion people could be affected in, in just some zones. And they may have to, uh, they may not be happy. They might move. So I, I got to thinking, Brian, you know, beyond sea level rise and things like that, this adds to the sea level rise, by the way. Politicians, when they say something like that, and then you hear a climate scientist talk, it sounds very differently. So I made a mashup. This is a four-minute mashup of climate scientists talking about the ocean current possibly stopping and why it's important, and some recent comments from largely Canadian politicians with oil interests, and just to hear a little bit of a contrast and how ridiculous that is. Science. The Gulf Stream is a powerful surface current and a vital component of the largest heat transfer on Earth, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC. The AMOC acts as a global conveyor belt, moving warm surface water north and cold deep water south, helping to regulate our global climate. That the rapid melting of the Greenland ice sheet should lead to this circulation's disruption or even collapse. Politics. Premier Scott Moe is standing by comments he made recently in which he said, I don't care, when referencing Saskatchewan's per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Science. A scenario with almost unimaginable consequences. If the AMOC tips, the climate suddenly gets incredibly greater seasonality, cold, harsh winters and even hotter summers. But I'd be most concerned in the tropics because we would potentially lose the monsoon in West Africa, which would be a humanitarian catastrophe. 
and also disrupt the monsoon in India severely, which is the livelihoods of over a, a billion people. Politics. The Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities says policies that vilify CO2 are illogical and unpredictable. We move that Saskatchewan remove itself from any national or international agreements that reference net zero. Science. The increased horizontal temperature gradient will drive superstorms stronger than any in modern times. All hell will break loose in the North Atlantic and neighboring lands. Politics. Removing the designation of CO2 as a pollutant and recognizing that carbon dioxide is the foundational nutrient of all life on Earth. Science. And if you shut that down, uh, that advantage will go. It will get a lot colder in especially Great Britain, Scandinavia, of course, Iceland. But there are other consequences of worldwide um, uh, impact. Uh, one of them is a shifting of the tropical rainfall belts. They are where the Earth is warmest, which is now north of the equator because of the northern hemisphere being warmer than the southern hemisphere by one to two degrees Celsius. Because of that cross-equatorial heat transport by the AMOC, if you shut that down, tropical rainfall belts move south. Politics. The resolution also went on to advocate for even more CO2. Science. So we know it's unstable. We know then the tropical rainfall belt shift. That means for tropical countries, the, you know, the rainfall is not where people are used to it, where the tropical rainforests are. Uh, there it will be missed. And in other regions which are not used to these extremely high precipitation amounts, uh, there will be flooding. Politics. Members of Alberta's ruling United Conservative Party have voted overwhelmingly to abandon the province's emissions reduction targets and recognize carbon dioxide as a foundational nutrient for all life on Earth. Science. There is also the effect on sea level. Sea level will rise by about an additional uh, 50 centimeters or so around the North Atlantic, including the American Atlantic coast if you shut down the AMOC. So that's additional rise to the global mean rise. Politics. During his push for the White House, Trump has called climate change a hoax and one of the great scams of all time. While vowing to delete spending on clean energy, abolish insane incentives for Americans to drive electric cars, scrap various environmental rules, and unleash a drill baby, drill wave of new oil and gas. Science. There are also, there's the effect of less CO2 uptake by the ocean because we the water sinking down to a couple of thousand meters depths takes CO2 down. If that stops, that will not happen anymore. So atmospheric CO2 rises faster. And finally, disruption of marine biology in the whole North Atlantic, Northern Atlantic region, inclusive uh, the fisheries. Politics. Science. Politics. Science. If you believe that climate change is real and an existential threat to our country and the world, you got to vote for Kamala because Trump thinks it is a hoax. And by the way, this is an issue that has not been talked enough about in this campaign. If Trump wins, the struggle, the global struggle against climate change is over. Because if the largest economy in the world, the United States, pulls back, so will China, so will Europe, and God only knows the kind of world that our kids and grandchildren will be living in because of climate change. All right, I'm gonna need a stiff drink after today's show. There's a massive solar panel recycling plant coming to Georgia. So this is, uh, again, another project from the uh, Biden-Harris administration that is due in part to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and all of the clean energy uh, spending that's coming from that. So this is a company called Solar Cycle. Uh, the plant is going to be in Cedartown, Georgia. It's going to be able to recycle 10 million solar panels a year. And by 2030, they think that they can handle about one quarter of all the panels that are reaching their end of life. Now, you know, solar panels can last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but of course their output decreases. So um, we're not totally sure how long people are going to keep their panels uh, in service. And, you know, disposing all, of all of them is a huge issue because eventually they will need to be 
uh, disposed of and stopped working eventually. Uh, but, you know, massive recycling plants like this can do a lot. They say that they can recycle 99% of the materials uh, in the panels, which wow. is uh, super impressive. I, yeah, I didn't think that it would be that high, but here we are. Wow. Yeah, and this includes bifacial panels, which are coming is that right? more popular. Yeah, this has been an issue previously, I guess, with uh, you know solar panel recycling, but they uh, say they've got a technology that they can do regular panels or bifacial panels and do it efficiently. And they're also building a new solar glass plant right next door, and they will be able to feed some of the recycled oh. materials uh, into that uh, to make the kind of specialized glass that you need to produce more solar panels. And of course, this is one of the goals of the Inflation Reduction Act is to bring this kind of manufacturing uh, back on a uh, big scale in the USA. And, you know, this is just another uh, example of that happening. They're going to be uh, um, online in mid-2025 with, uh, you know, starting at 2 million panels capacity and then eventually going up to 10 million capacity. So the people that want to burn more fossil fuels often say wind turbines, um, solar panels, batteries, car batteries, EV batteries are going to end up in the landfill. Of course, they're not. They're valuable. And we, we had a story last week where um, a solar panel from 20 years ago, the silicon in that from a 50 watt panel could go into a 400 watt panel today because we use a lot less silicon. And I expect innovation because we, we see it all the time. We report on it is still happening with solar panels all the time. Yeah. Um, and 20 years ago, they weren't making that many of them. And they weren't making a lot of profit. Well, they're not making a lot of profit now because it's such a cutthroat industry. But there's a lot to be sold. So if you make a half a penny on something and you sell a billion of them, it's something, right? That's, there's just so many being made. Yeah, this is technically still early days for all of this technology, which all works perfectly well. It works really well enough to really, uh, you know, deploy all over the world. And all of that technology, including batteries and wind turbines, it's all just getting better. Well, coming up, it's the lightning round. The lightning it's round time is for the a fast round. look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy and transportation. The Honda Prologue is an all-electric SUV built by General Motors. And essentially the same vehicle as the Chevy Blazer EV, but despite this, Honda's only EV is still selling better than the Blazer EV, which I can understand if you're a Honda owner, just like a Toyota owner, you've been craving a Honda EV, and unfortunately... They didn't have anything together as far as their act is concerned, and they had to buy Chevys. But it will be serviced by Honda. It will be backed up by Honda, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, be as good quality as a Honda. Uh, I'd be very disappointed if it wasn't. Yeah, I would always have a preference, probably, for Honda over GM, just as a brand preference. But uh, you know, either way, they're, oh, they're yeah. both EVs. I would too. It's proof that many Honda customers are ready for EVs, obviously, so maybe they should make some. Saudi Arabia launches a tender for 8 gigawatt hours of battery storage in the world's largest battery deal. That's a battery that would output a nuclear reactor's worth of electricity for 8 hours per day. Story and PV Magazine. Breaking news, Brian. Quebec reached 34% plug-in market share in the third quarter of this year. Undoubtedly, get this, displacing California as North America's ZEV leader. Yeah, California around 22%, as we were mentioning earlier, in terms of new car sales. Quebec has some pretty sweet rebates, which are going to start to go down one of these days, they say. That yeah. I think they're planning to go down. So I think it's $9,000 plus $5,000 from the federal government. And as I've said on the show, which is obvious to most people, you'd be an idiot not to buy an EV with $14,000 off. Even if it's a bit pricey, it's going to be overall a much cheaper experience uh, to operate and a much better experience. In China, 140 steel companies completed their ultra-low emission transformation this year. Of course, they're not all companies. They're sometimes enterprises in China okay. because they're communist. And, you know, that's... That's a bit beyond my pay grade, the difference, but there we are. 
It says, CES Fast Fact, making one cubic meter of concrete emits as much carbon as burning a full tank of gasoline in a large SUV. That is from the Pimbana Institute, Pimbana.org, link in your show notes. China, October, new energy vehicle sales. That's all things that have a plug or don't use gas. Wholesale record at, uh, no, they do use gas because some of them are plug-in. But it's a record 1.4 million. 1.4 million. In, in one month. Yeah. One month. Yeah. I, it seems like it wasn't long ago that there was one million made every year. And I was, yay, look at us, a million EVs. They made yeah. that in a month in one 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 country. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons that uh, Toyota sales have finally started to slip. BYD, the Chinese automotive company, is launching 10 EV models within a year. Compare that to Tesla, which has launched one. Last year, the Biden administration cited one of China's largest solar panel makers for evading U.S. tariffs. Now that same company, Brian, is in line to receive more than a billion dollars in federal U.S. subsidies for a factory it is building in Texas. Sorry, I have a rare cough. That's from Politico. Uh, celebrating five years of the Clean Energy Show, Brian, when we started the podcast five years ago, 3% of vehicles sold in the world were electric. And we were quite happy, but we also knew that was going up. Now it's 20%. And growing 20% year on year, and much faster for, for other segments of that um, transportation, such as two and three wheels. That's from Bloomberg. Uh, 12 United States states, including the largest by economic output, California, now generate enough un renewable electricity each year to cover more than 50% of their electricity needs. 12 states, half of them have renewable energy covering their grid energy needs. Waymo, this is the driverless taxi company, an offshoot of Google. Uh, Waymo driverless rides are on a hockey stick curve. In August 2023, 12,000 rides were given for the month. But in August 2024, that is 312,000 for the month. So they are at a point where they're expanding and there's, you know, they've reached the technology um, maturation where the software is knows what it's doing and there's no drivers there anymore. Pretty amazing. That's great. Uh, and finally this week, federal public servants in Ottawa, Canada, that's the capital of Canada, if you don't know, and a lot of people don't, uh, who work remotely, those people who work remotely for the government contributed 25% fewer emissions than those who worked only from the office. I have a friend, we have a friend, we'll call him Kevin. He works from yeah. home and he works for the federal government, not yeah. in Ottawa, but here where we live on the Canadian prairies. Uh, likes working from home, still a miserable person, I think, generally speaking, but. <laughs> <laughs> and he's well, not we've listening. used a pseudonym, Kevin, so that's Sure, yes, that. it could be anybody. A new report suggests as a major public sector union fights against more mandated office days. Yes, they're, the union is fighting against going back to the office. And yeah, 25% fewer emissions. Remote workers on the Quebec side of the Ottawa River, because uh, the capital, Ottawa, is on the border between Ontario, which is largely English, and the province of Quebec, which is across the river, which is largely French-speaking, uh, contributed even fewer emissions because they've got so much hydro in Quebec. It's almost all hydro, thanks largely to greener homes as well, heated by electricity. Even ele inefficient electric baseboards, rather than natural gas, because the electricity is so clean. And the province is virtually all renewable grid, the report said. This is from the Energy Mix. The link is in your show notes. And that's it for the lightning round. And that is it for our show this week. You can contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com, around social media, we're Clean Energy Pod. And you can join our Patreon community for free to get special posts not found elsewhere. The link is in the show notes. And you can also support the show with a purchase from the Clean Energy Store that's again listed in the show notes or on our website. Thank you to all our Patreon members, including Clean Club members and Apple Podcast subscribers, which you can do right on your podcast app in Apple. Hit the subscribe button, pay $1.99 per month, and you help us out and get stuff in return. 
rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Always asking for that. And welcome to new listeners to the show. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. Not subscribe in the podcast Apple way, but just make sure you get those new episodes delivered every week. Follow us, I guess. There's now a distinction between follow and subscribe. So, yeah. God help me. I hope my election prediction is right. And we will see you next week, barring the end of the world. See you next week. <laughs>